One thing have we desired of you, O Lord, and that will we seek after, that we may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire within your temple. We as your people today, we lift up our hearts before you with thanksgiving and praise, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to your holy name. Now may you be pleased, Holy Spirit, to teach us through the preaching of the word, the truth. In Christ's name, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you may be seated. The sermon is entitled, The Slandering Accuser and the Forgiving Defender of Joshua the High Priest. Last Sunday's lectionary reading in Isaiah chapter 59 disclosed that Israel's condition was in such a mess that the prophet Isaiah said that there was no man and no intercessor who was willing to stand in the gap to put things in order, to make things right. So therefore the Lord himself, the Lord took the initiative, Yahweh took the initiative to make things right by standing in the gap for his people as the intercessor. And yet we see the Lord as also the warrior. For Isaiah said that the Lord put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. The Lord that we saw last week in Isaiah's, what we call, many call the gospel according to Isaiah, that the Lord is the intercessory warrior called, and he called his people out of their sins through repentance and faith by bringing salvation to them. How did the Lord bring salvation to them? He became their righteousness. That being, he became their salvation. Yahweh saved them by grace. He did it. Under the old covenant, he saved them by grace. We see the same emphasis in Psalm 76, which was appointed last Sunday as one of the Psalms, and was also again brought to our attention in the lectionary readings this week, just a few days ago where Psalm 76 says, In Judah is God known, his name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. And it says, There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield and the sword and the battle. The warrior king conquers all sin, all evil, and all of his enemies within his tabernacle, in worship, the enemies of God are defeated. That being through the worship of his people. It takes leadership, the leadership of a warrior, to disciple his warriors. We saw that last week. During last week's epistle lesson in Ephesians 6, I proposed a question is the armor of God that we as the church are called to put on based upon the Roman soldier's armor or is it representative of the high priest, the high priest and his sacerdotal or ecclesiastic vestments? The lectionary lessons today draw our attention to this question. In Zechariah 3, we see Satan attempting to make void the favor of God by slandering Joshua the high priest after a 70-year captivity in Babylon. In Psalm 32, we see King David, who was also attacked by his enemies, and he magnifies God's defense of his life, especially that God did not impute sin to himself. In St. Paul's epistle, Philippians chapter 1, St. Paul proclaims that the church has the excellency of Christ's mercies. And in the gospel lesson for today, Jesus advances 
his warrior kingdom theology of forgiveness. Because forgiveness is the extension of the worship of God. Let's look at Zechariah 3, the slandering accuser and the forgiving defender. So turn in your Bibles to Zechariah 3. That's going to be our main focus. And at the end of the sermon, I will bring us to the gospel lesson. But let's look at Zechariah 3. Here beginneth the reading of the Old Testament lesson for today, beginning at the first verse of the prophet Zechariah, chapter 3. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Well, here we have the restoration of the priesthood after a 70-year exile. And if we remember the readings and the readings this week, the Old Testament readings in the lectionary, it was drawing our attention to how terrible it was in Judah. Israel had been taken into captivity in the 8th century, in 722 to 721 B.C. And 150 years later, Judah, the southern kingdom, followed in the same suit. And the prophets of God to the, to the northern tribes and to the prophets of God to the southern tribes were calling the people to repent, and especially the southern kingdom. Don't make the same mistakes that your brethren to the north made when they put the worship of God in Samaria. And they made up things. They made up the worship of God, not according to God's plan. And eventually the Assyrians took them away into captivity. So the prophets of God are, went and said to the people of Judah, the southern kingdom, don't make the same mistakes that your brethren to the north made, lest you also, as you break the covenant, the curses will come your way. You will be judged. And the day came. And I'm not going to elaborate on it because I've preached on this before. But the bottom line is King Zedekiah thought he, not Zechariah, but King Zedekiah thought he could outsmart the enemy. And the enemy said that they were going to take over. They were going to destroy all of Jerusalem. One prophet came to King Zedekiah and said, you're going to go to Babylon. Another prophet came to him and said, you will not see Babylon. So Zedekiah, using um, enlightenment reason, thought, oh, I got this thing figured out. Both prophets are wrong. So Zedekiah took his sons, his family, and his servants and escaped at, by night, only to be captured. Then they took the sons of Zedekiah and, and made his father watch, made Zedekiah watch as each one of the sons was slain, was put to death in front of the father. So there would be no heritage to his family, no descendants. Then they came to King Zedekiah and they gouged out his eyes and they took him to Babylon. And King Zedekiah had to live the rest of his life in a foreign land. Temple destroyed, his nation taken over, his sons killed, and he went to Babylon, like the prophet said, but he never saw Babylon. Take heed lest we fall when we don't listen to the prophets. In the scriptures it says, and this is why we are whole Bible Christians. We take the whole Bible. We're not just New Testament Christians. We live in the New Covenant, but the foundation of our faith is based on what we get in the Old Covenant. So the preaching from Zechariah today is very important. 
He showed me Joshua the high priest. This vision discloses that Jerusalem's temple, its walls, and the city was going to be restored after a 70-year captivity in Babylon. This is the story of the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel in the lion's den, the fiery furnace, all those stories. Ezekiel going down to the river Kabar and, and getting the vision, Ezekiel chapter 1. All those fantastic things happened. Uh, the glory of God showing up, and Ezekiel was shocked that the glory of God even showed up in a foreign land, not in the holy land. Well, because God has always been desirous to have all the nations of the earth under his rule, under his protection, under his guardianship. And so the Lord shows up. Ezekiel wrote about it. And then Ezekiel was given, if you read the book of Ezekiel, he's given visions of what actually was going on in the temple before it was destroyed. The people had become so vain. They had violated the commands of God that even on the walls within the temple, they had pornography. Priests had put put pornography on the walls. And Ezekiel sees all this, the corruption within the church and the corruption within the state. Now the prophet Jeremiah had said, when the Chaldeans, the Babylonians come, just surrender to him. If you surrender, you'll live. But if you fight against him, you will die by famine, pestilence, and the sword. And again, like I said, with King Zedekiah, he thought he had it all figured out. And that was not the case. So after 70 years, it's been said by many commentators and scholars that Israel finally learned its lesson after centuries to get away from idolatry, that they had to live with it for 70 years in a pagan land where they had to eat, I will say the word crap, the crap of the culture that was foreign against God, the worship of God. We think of our own culture right now and the rot that's in our culture. However, there's a message, there's a lining of restoration in the book of Zechariah because we find that Zechariah then says there's going to be a return, there's going to be a branch who will emerge out of the stump which looks like nothing out of that branch. That branch is the Messiah, Christ. He will bring the change. Now, in the meantime, we have Joshua the high priest. Well, Josh, Joshua the high priest and, this, and the prophet Zechariah telling the story here, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, these all spoke prophetically to the Jews as they're returning from Babylon. So all three prophets. Haggai was an older prophet. His, his ministry was not that long, just months. Zechariah's main ministry is for two years. But they are called to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Eventually, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah talk about the rebuilding of the walls, but the rebuilding of the temple. And Zechariah is speaking specifically about the internal parts of the temple, beginning with the high priest. Now, Joshua, the high priest, was the first high priest after the captivity. Bishop Lightfoot said there were actually between the exile, the return back to Jerusalem, until uh, Matthias, dealing with the, the period of the Maccabees, there were 53 high priests during that period of time, according to Bishop Lightfoot. But... Joshua the high priest, this is not Joshua from the book of Joshua, this is Joshua, Yeshua, the high priest, was in priestly succession from his father, Josedek, who had earlier died in Babylon. Now, Joshua the high priest was praised, among other men, for his services in restoring the temple. And in the apocryphal books of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 49, verse 12, which is also referred to as Sirach 49, 12, it says this, how shall we magnify Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel is the king that God raised up at this period of time. Zerubbabel is the king. Now the representative of, he's representative of the state. The representative of the church is Joshua the high priest. And so in uh, Ecclesiasticus it says, 
How shall we magnify Zerubbabel? He was like a signet ring on his right hand. And so was Yeshua, son of Jozadek. In their days, they built the house and raised the temple holy to the Lord, destined for everlasting glory. What was Joshua the high priest actually doing? Well, he was to function in his official priestly calling, his sacerdotal calling, to intercede for God's people. He was presiding and standing in the gap. And yet, he's got clothing on that is spoiled. It's unclean. It's tattered. Some believe that it's the leftovers from seven years before. That would be seven decades. Others conclude that it's basically the vision that Zechariah had was it represented the Jews rebellion against God. The priestly garments were supposed to be clean. They were to look nice and not be tattered. Think about the gospel lesson a few weeks ago. The wedding feast, right? And the one man that came and chose not to put on the royal garments of the wedding, the covenantal wedding, and he was cast out because he didn't have the right apparel on. Symbolism matters. Clothing matters. Uh, just the other day, uh, Joey and I and uh, Damien, uh, where'd Damien go? Okay. All right. Did he fall under the power of God? <laughs> All right. What? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so Joey, Damien, and I were uh, chatting with one of the, the staff members uh, here on campus, and he's a Russian Orthodox a great, great man. But I came in, it was, uh, it was Reformation Day, actually the day before. I was dressed up like Martin Luther, carrying my nine to five thesis, had the cap on. I had, I had my black cassock uh, and my pectoral cross on, um, or the cross that represents our, our uh, Western Convocation, the deanery here. And, and he said to me, oh, I don't know, I didn't know you Anglicans dress like that. He said, I'm ready to see if you'll take my confession. <laughs> because I'm, right, he said it, right? You, you're a witness that. I'm trying to get in the mouth of two or more witnesses. But Damien's not here to, ju- to stand with it. So we'll get on this case later for walking out. All right. Uh, symbolism matters. Clothing matters. And in this passage of Scripture, The clothing of the high priest really did matter. Again, then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Yeah, Joshua the high priest is not looking good. And this is an opportunity for Satan to bring slander. Well, here Joshua the high priest is fulfilling God's command that God gave to Adam at the beginning of time to serve and to protect God's holy garden, God's city, the city of God. Genesis 2.15, two Hebrew words are used, Abad and Shamar, to serve and to protect. And so, in many ways, Joshua the high priest was called to serve and to protect with the restoration of the temple being rebuilt. You've got to have a high priest in that temple. And so, but he's got to be properly attired. And he looks like a shambles. He looks pretty bad. And Satan took advantage of that. <laughs> yeah, just laughing and giving him a hard time. Well, to serve and to protect was Adam's righteous calling. And the readings today are pointing us to the Messiah, the second Adam, the last Adam, Jesus Christ who comes as the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, a different order. Uh, In the Oxford movement of the 19th century, John Keeble said this, and and my wife and I used to go to Keeble College a lot, and uh, Lou, you you were there for morning uh, matins, right? I lived there for two years. You lived there for two years, that's right. So Keeble. So anyway, uh, Keeble College, a great college there. Um, our, our daughter Shannon and family are in Oxford today uh, visiting. 
John Keeble said this, and this says the prophet, and he's referring to Jeremiah, and this says the prophet is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Tzidkenu, as if he should say the great thing whereby our Savior will make himself known upon earth is this, that being God, he has come down to make us truly righteous. He was manifested to take away our sins. For this cause, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's the words of John Keeble, to destroy the works of the devil. That's why Jesus came. One of his main things was to deal with this accuser of the brethren who constantly came against the leaders within Israel. The Lord said to Satan, well, the Joshua, the high priest is there, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Could it have been Satan? Yes, it was Satan that was there. The Lord rebuke you. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Ah, not just the Lord rebuke you. He's chosen Jerusalem. Joshua the high priest is going to be the representative for a rebuilt Jerusalem. Now we're talking about Second Temple Judaism. This is where we're going with this. I'm not talking about a dispensational view of a future temple. The church is the temple, ideally, because Christ is the temple. All right, but we'll, I just had to say that just in case um, you think I might be talking about a future rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. The church is the temple, and we're in him, and he is in us, and therefore we spread throughout the world, not made with hands, but through the blood of Christ. So the Lord rebuke you, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Well, John Calvin said about this passage, and by the way, talk about sacerdotal language from John Calvin. My goodness. I was listening, I was reading a whole lot of, of Calvin on Zechariah, and, and he, he sounds like somebody right out of the Oxford movement. Uh, it's just a point. Calvin said, the vision was given to the prophet for two reasons, that the faithful might know that their contest was with Satan, their spiritual enemy, rather than with any particular nations, and also that they might understand that a remedy was at hand, for God stood in defense of the priesthood which he had instituted. God then, in the first place, purposed to remind the faithful that they had to carry on war, not with flesh and blood, but with the devil himself. Now follows another reason for the prophecy, that God interposes and takes the part of his church against Satan. The Lord rebuke you, Satan, Joshua stood before the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord is Christ. Christ, again, stood in the gap, but he is now delegating the authority to this new high priest who is going to bring restoration to the people of God after they have gone through their period of being spanked by God for 70 years. They're ready to get back in order. But you got to have, you have to have the order of God within the church and within the state. And Joshua the high priest represents the church. Zerubbabel represents the state. Maybe these are the two witnesses that are referred to in Revelation chapter 11. Just food for thought. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers of darkness. Spiritual warfare. If you don't know we're in a spiritual war right now, wake up. <laughs> we are in a spiritual war. But the battle has been won. We have to always remember that. Christ has already knocked it to the devil. And we'll get there in this sermon. I'll get there. But right now we need to see how he tr tried to mess things up at that period of time. Always remember that it's the Lord who rebukes Satan what he's done in the past, what he does presently, and what he does in the future. What Zechariah described here is that there is a way back or restoration after the rebellion. The angel of the Lord, or Christ, stood in the gap and defended his people 
against the accuser. So we have the slandering accuser, but then we have the forgiving defender. The slandering accuser and the forgiving defender. David Chilton said, Satan was the accuser of Job, Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2, and of Joshua the high priest here in Zechariah 3. Chilton goes on to say, and as can be seen from both of those cases, his supposedly legal accusations are mere lies, mere lies in the court of heaven. The accuser of God's people is a slanderer, the father of the lie. Not just the father of lies, the father of what St. Paul calls in Romans 1, the lie. The lie. Calling good evil and evil good. Indicative of things in our culture right now. Well, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Boy, Dr. Rutt, Father Rutt, you're kind of being repetitive here. Yeah. That's right. The word of God needs to be said. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. At least I'm not singing it like the country western singer that sings this song. If you know who I'm referring to, I, I know the song by heart, and I could, if I had a guitar, I'd probably sing it, but no, I, I'm going to restrain. Uh, all right, indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Well, what is this brand? Well, after 70 years, Judah, through their defeat, through captivity, distress, and misery, they finally came to their senses. However, the deliverance was completed. God's people should not be cast again into the fire. In Amos chapter 4, verse 11, it says this, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And yet the Lord still plucked Judah from the fire. So even in Amos' day, the rebellion that was there, the people were not listening. We find here something else quite interesting in St. Jude's epistle. Jude, verses 22 and 23, it says this, And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Was Jude referring to Amos' statement? I think so. All right, verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. Again he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. And then I said, Let them put a clean turban which means literally a miter on his head. So they put a clean miter on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. Well, the Bible says that Joshua the high priest was clothed in filthy garments. These filthy garments were the high priest's vestments, but they looked pretty bad. They didn't go to the dry cleaners. They, what's going on here? What were the high priest's vestments? Mainly... The miter and the garments. Within part of his garments is the statement, holiness to Yahweh, holiness to the Lord. That's very significant. Now, what's a miter? Well, it's a mark of the high priest's office and a symbol of his authority. Alfred Edersheim states that the miter of the high priest differed from the headgear of the ordinary priest. Calvin said that the crown here is to be the priest's miter, for we know that this was the chief ornament whenever the priest came to the altar of incense. The miter is important. Personally, I had difficulty with that becoming an Anglican. I have to admit. I'll make it a confession. 21 years ago, I took holy orders. But I had to prepare my family and friends for the fact that when I was going to take holy orders, the bishop's going to come in with a funny hat on, as some people would call a funny hat. He was going to come in with a miter. And that's what bishops do. And I, 
be, and at that time, a very low churchman. I'm, I'm having some difficulty with it, but you know, the bishop's the bishop. I'm you know, taking holy orders. Shut up, Rut. Um, symbolism matters. That same bishop that laid hands on me was Bishop Grote, who's with the Lord now. Uh, children, when I make this statement, you might want to close the children's eyes. Bishop Grote one time told me, he said, concerning a certain branch within Christ Church that he dearly loved, but and this, church, this branch of Christ Church was very liturgical. However, they had taken a position of being as unchurchy looking as possible and get rid of, and no symbolism at all. Get rid of symbolism. It doesn't matter. What matters is the heart. I have said this before in class. So you have Damien now. Yeah, welcome back, Damien. All right. So the Bishop Grote was telling me the story about this, and he said, uh, he was talking to this pastor, and the pastor said, symbolism doesn't matter at all. Now cover the children's eyes. And Bishop Grote did this. Please cover his eyes. Bishop Grote went <laughs> right in front of the pastor's face. Did you see that, guys? Yeah. <laughs> and the pastor said, what are you doing? Why did you do that? And Bishop Grote just said, I just lifted my finger. I just lifted my finger. Uh, what, what are you all upset about? And then the pastor said, oh, my God. <laughs> I get your point. Sizzlum, symbolism does matter. Now, the mitre that the bishop wears is extremely important because the bishop's mitre takes us back to this passage in Zechariah 3. It actually takes us back to Exodus, but the bottom line is the mitre is important. The mitre is the mark of the priest's office and symbol of his authority. When, when Bishop Sutton comes here to confirm, he's going to wear a mitre. He'll come in, in the processional, he'll wear a mitre. He'll take the mitre off. And at certain points of the service, he'll put the mitre back on when he's functioning in an official capacity. Why? It's because Bishop Sutton's a, a big shot. He's, in my opinion, one of the finest theologians on the planet right now. That's my opinion. I've known him since 1985. I've read his books, and uh, he's a pretty sharp guy. Uh, but it's not because he's a big guy. He represents the church as a bishop. He represents the church. And any person that wears a mitre better be holy. And I do know Bishop Sutton to be very a holy man, a broken man, and concerned about humility. We have... People walking around with mitres on who are very unholy and are not representing the church, especially if it's a woman wearing a mitre. Nothing against women, it's just that's not God's order. Okay. What else did the high priest wear? Well, the breastplate with 12 stones, the Urim. And the thummim, very hard to say, thummim. And the eight sacred vestments, double what the other priest wore. The other priest wore four, linen breeches, coat, girdle, and bonnet. But you have the high priest with gold vestments. The ephod was the breastplate, the former of the four colors of the sanctuary, white, blue, purple, and scarlet and inwrought with threads of gold. Eusebius, the early church historian, said, St. John wore the patalon, an insignia of the high priest worn on the forehead. It's St. John wore that. In fact, it's, there, there are different ones that, that believe that St. John wore the high priest's garments, similar to the priest in the temple. He was bishop of Ephesus. There's, there's a tradition for this. Professor Meredith Klein said this, In the first part of the vision, the angel makes judicial disposition 
of an accusation brought against Joshua the high priest. And after rebuking the accuser, the angel turns to Joshua and first performs an act signifying the removal of, removal of Joshua's iniquity, verse 4. And then oversees the priestly investiture, or the place putting on of the vestments. Again, the high priest would wear eight different vestments. The climax of the latter being the crowning with the mitre, with its precious stone, the engraved golden plate of consecration. Meredith Klein, professor at Westminster Seminary. Yeah. This is what it's rooted in. The Episcopal order in, of church government with bishops wearing mitres has its roots in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. So when the bishop shows up here, I, in 21 years, I've grown to really respect when a bishop wears a mitre because it's the reminder that symbolism does matter, and I'm not going to give you the example of that. Sy symbolism does matter. Verses 6 through 9, or actually verse 10, And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If you walk in my ways, and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house, and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among these who are standing here. Now listen, Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed they are men who are a symbol. For behold, I am going to bring in my servant the branch. Here's another symbol. But the branch represents whom? Christ. Christ. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. The forgiving defender is the promised Messiah, the branch, Jesus Christ. Jesus did remove the iniquity of God's people in one day. Now in the context of Zechariah's day, he then clothed the royal priesthood of that day Joshua the high priest with the proper garments. The investiture was important because God was restoring his order. God is about order. One of the finest evangelists we've known in our lifetime is Billy Graham. And Billy Graham, I heard him preach at Soldier's Field in Chicago when I was five years old. I was mesmerized by his preaching. Billy Graham was brought up a Presbyterian. You probably didn't know that. Later, he was influenced by the Baptist. He went that direction. And in the last uh, biography of, of Billy Graham, his editor asked him a question. If you had an opportunity to do it all over, what would you be in, in, the, in the ministry? Now, mind you, he was a Presbyterian and became Baptist. He said, if I had a chance to do it all over again, I would become an Anglican. Yes. He said this, I've got it in the book if you want to see it. I would become an Anglican because there's something about Anglican order that draws me. A lot of it has to do with the Lord's table, the way we understand the Lord's table. But we move on. When the bishop comes here in February wearing the mitre, just remember that this mitre represents the restored apostolic faith and order that resides in Christ bride, the church. Christ bride, the church, to confirm the confirmands. I'll end here with looking at this whole thing in the gospel lesson. The debt that the man owed was equivalent to $10 million, and he was forgiven. He could never pay back $10 million. How many could, of you could have done that? But he forgave the man $10 million. And the man that was forgiven turns around, takes the neck of the guy that owns him, the equivalency of 20 bucks, $20.
and grabs him by the neck, says, pay me or else. And then the Lord, the, the business guy in all of this said, you wicked man, you wicked man, I forgave you a huge debt and then you've turned around and you've stuck it to this guy. The point of the story, the gospel, is about how the master was moved with compassion to forgive the impossible debt. That's the gospel. For the gospel to work, though, we have to have order. There has to be the proper order, as we saw in the Old Testament lesson. Well, Satan was a slandering accuser, functioning as an attorney for the prosecution and attempted to advance legal charges in God's courtroom. The evil one who tirelessly accuses the brethren day and night, Revelation 12, verse 10. There is a, a message about the blessedness of the gospel of the new covenant, and that is this. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren is what? Cast down. He accused them day and night. He has been cast down. Satan's been knocked down from his previous level of influence. Earlier, Satan took pleasure in deceiving the nations from receiving the gospel through the gospel promise to Israel. However, now the devil is restrained from that previous influence. He's bound. He's in chains. The gospel chains Satan now. Satan is not in the place he was before. Jesus said this. The prince of the world is judged already. He's cast on. I saw Satan fall from, light, from heaven like lightning. This is Luke 2, Luke, Luke chapter 10. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, and you shall have authority over all the works of darkness, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Well, is that just Father Rutt's view? Well, it's more than my view. I like to end with a couple quotes from St. Bernard of Clairvaux who said this about Satan. What is the present state of Satan? St. Bernard, the Cistercian monk, said, But now hear the slander. Heaven is my throne, says God. Earth is my footstool. He does not say east or west or mention any other region of heaven. He says, The whole of heaven is my throne. Therefore, Satan, you cannot set up your throne in any part of heaven. This is St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who was read a lot by Luther and Calvin. For he has claimed it all for himself. You cannot set it up on earth, for the earth is his footstool. Indeed, it is on the solid earth that the church sits, founded on the solid rock. So, Satan, what are you going to do? You're cast out of heaven, Bernard, Bernard goes on to say. You can't stay on earth. Choose for yourself a place in the air. He sounds kind of like Luther centuries later with his theology of, you know, wind. We looked at last week. Choose for yourself a place in the air, not to sit, but to hang there, so that you who have tried to shake the stability of eternity may feel the punishment of your own instability. He's not in the position he was. Satan is not in the position he was in heaven with Joshua the high priest, or Job. You must wander about heaven and earth while the Lord sits on a throne high and lifted up, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. You have no place but the air. No place but the air. That's where Satan's place is. He's the prince and power of the air, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The air. He doesn't have any authority on the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Satan is cast out of heaven. No authority there. So he's in the air. But what did St. Athanasius say? Here's what St. Athanasius said about the cross of Christ. The air is the sphere of the devil, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. But the Lord came to overthrow the devil and to purify the air. He was an environmentalist. How did he purify the air? Hanging on the cross between earth and heaven. Jesus is now above the earth and is beneath the heaven to identify with us. Why? Because he stands in the gap 
and he took it to the devil. No longer are you to be the accuser that you once were. You are now defeated. Yeah, amen. Athanasius goes on to say, and to make a way for us up to heaven. He, Christ, cleansed the air from all the evil influences of the enemy. That's what our Lord has done. Now, demons will accuse us. Just take up Luther's theology of wind and deal with them that way. If you were not here last week, you can ask me about this. The power of forgiveness is the way that we overcome the deception that's in the world by Satan. Remember, we are to forgive. Satan cannot forgive. We can forgive. Why? Because we have been forgiven. Satan has not been forgiven. Jesus empowers us to forgive 70 times 7. The church overcomes the world, the flesh, and the devil when we forgive others. Christ's priestly calling for us is to be like Jesus. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when we deal with the culture and all the rot in the culture, that has to be our attitude. We come as the representatives, just as Joshua the high priest. We come as the priesthood of the church, and we confront the powers of darkness. And we say, you don't own these people. You've owned their minds, but we're bringing the truth into the midst, and the truth will set them free. We need to be ready for a great revival. We need to be ready for what God is doing. He's shaking the world right now. The world is in such a mess, but we have the message. We have the message of forgiveness, and we have received forgiveness. And I finish with this quote, very short one, from a Puritan, Thomas Watson, Watson said, we need not climb up to heaven to see whether our sins are forgiven. Let us look into our hearts and see if we can forgive others, if we can forgive others, we need not doubt but that God has forgiven us. Let's take that forgiveness to the culture and let's receive that forgiveness again at the table. Amen.